Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M and T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization. Hello, my name is Michael Stoll, host of Building New York. Certain people spend their lifetime in public service, and my guest today has spent his entire lifetime in public service and has done so many things to change the city of New York. Uh, my guest today is Carl Weisbrod, the president of Trinity Real Estate and executive vice president of Trinity Church. That's correct. Okay. Nice to be so, here, Michael. You know, I always like guys who were born here. You were born in uh, Manhattan, right? Which is no longer the hospital. It was Flower Fifth. Flower, I was born at Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital, but I lived in the Bronx in my early years. And then just five years of my life, I lived in Parkchester. And you moved to Kew Gardens? Fresh Meadows. Fresh Meadows, okay. And you went to high school where? Jamaica High School. And then at a young age, at 16, for some reason, you decided to go to Cornell, right? I did. Uh, a great decision. I loved Cornell and uh, had a great four, four years there and then came back to New York to go to law school. Um, and lived in Brooklyn. So now it's, it's 1968, another great economic time period. <laughs> uh, and, and here's this guy who you said to me, I think part of it was you, your parents were very public advocated, you know, involved with this public issues and you were uh, molded partially by John F. Kennedy, uh, and it's 1968. And what does Carl Weisbrod, the attorney, do? What's the I first graduated year? from law school, and I went to work in the then just beginning legal services program, um, representing, for the most part, uh, uh, poor people in Harlem and on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And uh, largely, uh, I, my little area of expertise was representing squatters who um, had moved into vacant buildings and tried to set up homes there. I wasn't involved in helping them move in, but once they did move in, I did represent them and made sure that they had their legal rights. And, um, and many of them, some of them, ended up making political statements and soon moving out. Some of them stayed. I then went, uh, I went, I went to work for city government for a period of time in uh, the Lindsay administration with um, uh, Amalia Batanzas, who was uh, uh, a, a great, one of the great, great uh, uh, commissioners of the Lindsay administration, and uh, who you with said many, to me was also a mentor, one of the Was a mentor, it was a very important mentor for me, and then went to, I was, uh, uh, I met Herb Sturz, who created the Vera Institute of Justice, and um, started working for Herb in 1972, running an offshoot of, of Vera called the Wildcat Service Corporation, 
which employs to this day its uh, uh, ex-offenders, ex-addicts, the most long-term welfare recipients. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers have been employed by Wildcat over the last 30 years. It's uh, 35 years now. It's really remarkable how many people have been employed by Wildcat. What happens after Herb? 1974, Lindsay administration, Koch? Well, I worked for Herb at uh, Vera and uh, at Wildcat, which was a subsidiary, essentially, of Vera. And then in 1978, Herb Sturz became deputy mayor for criminal justice under uh, Ed Koch, and he and Bobby Wagner, who was then the city planning commission chairman, asked if I would uh, oversee Times Square uh, as the director of the mayor's office of Midtown Enforcement, which was at the time the entity that really coordinated all service delivery and law enforcement in Times Square. And you know what people have to realize, 30 years ago, Times Square was totally different than today. I mean, it was, how, how would you call it? I would say it was uh, uh, Times Square was, which unfortunately in those years represented, was the face of New York to the rest of the country and the world, was uh, a cesspool. It was, it was awful. Um, 42nd Street between 7th and 8th Avenue was uh, the most dangerous block in New York City. Five or six felonies a day were reported on that one street, that just that one block from 7th to 8th Avenue. It was so dangerous that women, um, f females, really uh, avoided it at almost all costs, even though it had a huge amount of pedestrian traffic because people would leave the Port Authority bus terminal and it's the center for the subway system. Uh, 8,000 people an hour would walk between 7th and 8th Avenue um, uh, on 42nd Street, but fewer than 10 percent of them were women. Um, women really avoided the block because they were scared, and rightly so, and it was a place where low-level drugs were sold, male prostitutes, uh, 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 chicken hawks and chickens, as they were known in those days, would uh, ply their trade, where a lot of people, runaways who were attracted by the bright lights of New York, um, uh, would congregate in Times Square and you know, around 42nd Street. It was, it was a dangerous place. So, so you go to the enforcement first, and then you get more involved with Times Square and the Times Square redevelopment, right? Well, I think it was clear. What happened was I, when I started in Times Square, um, the city strategy for decades, going back to Fiorello LaGuardia, had been to clean up, try to clean up Times Square, and all the efforts had really failed. Um, uh, and uh, at the start of the Koch administration, I remember sitting down with uh, then Police Commissioner Bob McGuire, and even though the city was very strapped for funds, he said, we really have to do something about Times Square, and I'll commit as much in the way of law enforcement resources as you need. And at the peak, really, there were around the clock of various different kinds of police officers, uh, narcotics officers, plainclothes officers, uh, anti-prostitution officers, and a, and a, and a 24-hour cycle, there'd be 200 police officers just assigned to the area right around 42nd Street. That's more than staff a, a good-sized precinct in many parts of, uh, of New York City. And it became apparent, I think, to all of us that, um, that law enforcement alone was not going to address the problems of, of Times Square. So when does Prudential get involved with Times Square and George Klein? That happened in the early 1980s. Uh, in, in the, uh, at the end of the 1970s, there were beginning to be several plans to uh, address the economic and physical issues and planning issues associated with, with Times Square. A lot of private groups were suggesting ideas. There was a famous city at 42nd Street with uh, uh, a host of uh, Rockefeller uh, interests and equitable. Um, and they went to Ed Koch, a mayor at that time, and said, look, we, we, here's a plan to redevelop Times Square. Would you say that one um, of the things which you were involved with, the Marriott Marquis, was part of the change of the Times Square neighborhood? That actually, yes, that was a parallel change. It was a very controversial uh, project when it was built. John Portman uh, had this dream of putting up one of his Portman hotels 
on 44th to 45th Street on Broadway. Um, it now, was, was that before the W.T. Grant building, which is now the Viacom building, or after? Afterwards. It was after the uh, 1515 Broadway was built. Uh, that building was largely vacant during the decade of the 70s. Um, in fact, the then State Urban Development Corporation had its offices there because it was so cheap. Um, they were just trying to help so out. I'm aging myself saying uh, the old W.T. Grant. W.T. Grant. It was... Right. Uh, um, it was, uh, it, it, was, it was difficult to attract private money to so, Times so, Square. So let's talk a little bit about the Marriott. It was very controversial um, because it involved the demolition of, of three very distinguished theaters. And even though at that time Broadway was not thriving in large measure, or at least a significant measure, because of conditions in the area and people, theater patrons, didn't want to go there, Nevertheless, the theaters are such an important part of New York's heritage and one of the things that makes New York unique that, understandably, a lot of interests really were opposed to these theaters coming down and a lot of people didn't like uh, the design of the, t uh, of the Portman Hotel and now called the Marriott Marquis. And in fact, it's, it's not the most attractive building in New York. It's frequently on the list of the ten least attractive buildings in New York. But, but. I think that the investment in that hotel, um, and that was certainly a trade-off, and the, uh, the loss of the theaters, nevertheless, the importance of that hotel to the redevelopment of Times Square can't be underestimated. It was important. Now, be besides Times Square, when do you go to the city planning, and when do you go to urban development? Which comes first? I first went to uh, the city planning commission in 1985 as uh, executive director. So let's talk a little bit about that because that you were saying to me, even though it was the entire five boroughs, a lot of that work was the outer boroughs. I mean, yes. uh, especially you know one of the <clears throat> the, the, the blighted areas we would call was Metro Tech. I mean, yes. downtown Brooklyn, nothing was happening. You had the Fulton Street shopping, which was always busy, which with A and S and the rest, which was really tumbling a little bit in the Albee Square Mall over there. And then you had New York City, uh, you know, uh, the college, not the, you know, uh, who owned New York... Right, uh, New York uh, Tech. Tech, who owned the property, and the Metro Tech. What was Metro Tech? Well, Metro Tech uh, was, it really, really have to go back a little in history. Metro Tech was ultimately uh, a result of the Regional Plan Association saying in the late 1970s, look, we should have a third business center in New York. We should have not just Midtown and Downtown, but Brooklyn, Downtown Brooklyn has the potential of being a really important business center. And furthermore, instead of seeing jobs and, and space leak across to New right, Jersey. Right, and that was what was happening. That was, because yes. that's when New Jersey was taking away a lot of the investment bankers and other things, they were going to Jersey City, they were going to Sam Lefrak, to that market, and Brooklyn, New York was losing it. New York was losing jobs, and we were competing against the New Jersey waterfront, which was uh, developing a sense of place. It was getting a center of uh, activity, and New York really had to respond, and, and uh, the city's public development corporation at that time, working with Regional Plan, working with New York Tech, uh, and working with other interests in downtown Brooklyn said, look, let's see if we can create a center here in downtown Brooklyn and came up with a number of projects, including what ultimately became the Brooklyn Marriott Hotel and Metrotech, which was an effort to create a high-tech business center for back office and front office businesses. Right. You had Chase, you had SAIC, you know. Exactly. Uh, uh, SIAC, which was the technical uh, uh, arm of the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange, and, uh, and uh, one Pier Point uh, Plaza, which was uh, housed uh, the technical, uh, technical uh, uh, TIS centers for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and others. and. Um, uh, and ultimately, the, uh, the dream was to create this center where um, uh, companies' technology needs could be met. Uh, Brooklyn Union Gas put its headquarters there. And the, the Marriott, the Brooklyn Marriott, that was the first hotel in Brooklyn in 
probably 50 years. I would think at least. Maybe, maybe, maybe even the Bossert was 1898. It couldn't have been 80 years, but it was pretty close. And, and then, you know, let's leave Brooklyn. You went to Queens, the tennis center was one of the projects. Well, the tennis was. center really happened later when I was at EDC, but, uh, but while I was at city planning and the Manhattan, Manhattan was also booming in the, in the early 80s and there was a lot of physical development. Um, and I really concentrated on the planning and approval process for the outer borough projects. Citibank um, building. Citibank in building City. in Long Island City, which uh, since there was a brilliant uh, idea on the part of uh, Citibank because it was literally one subway stop uh, uh, from uh, Citibank's headquarters on 53rd and Lexington, and uh, as I call uh, it, the, the Jolly two, Green Giant. It is still a beacon. It's the. Uh, it, I don't know if it is anymore, but when it was built, it was the tallest building between Manhattan and Boston. It was, uh, uh, and it still is uh, is uh, quite a. Despite what we see going on on the Long Island City waterfront and in Queens West today, it's still it's still a big symbol on. Uh, on the Queen's uh, horizon and, and for New York City. And it's, I, I actually think it's a great building. So then you get involved with UDC, right? Then I left city planning to uh, oversee the physical development of 42nd Street as a heading, uh, a subsidiary of the Urban Development Corporation. Uh, with specific responsibilities for Times Square. Which was the largest eminent domain ever in the city of New York? It was the largest and uh, certainly it broke the mold because the city had never before really s thought that it was necessary to use its eminent domain powers for urban renewal in Midtown Manhattan. The city always felt Midtown uh, could ultimately um, uh, market forces would, would keep Midtown afloat. But Times Square was the exception. There hadn't been on 42nd Street a new building built between 7th and 8th Avenue in a half century. Um, the land ownership was so splintered that, and, the, and the social conditions so bad that it would have been impossible for a developer to come in and try to redevelop some of that block. And it was important, especially in the, in the wake of the Marriott Marquis Hotel, to preserve the theaters in the mid block and not see those theaters uh, which, torn down. Which was preserved. Okay, well, the all of them vector, were preserved. All the, uh, all the yes. theaters were preserved, you know. And, you know, the interesting thing, as you said to me when we got together, was that um, just when you left, just before you were leaving, the, you, you signed the lease with Disney. We signed the letter of intent with letter. Disney. Uh, um, on the, the last day of, uh, of uh, the Dinkins administration in 1993, as then Deputy Mayor Barry Sullivan was leaving City Hall for the last time, he signed the letter of intent uh, that night, December 30th. It was. Uh, do, do you think you know? Do you think some people who have been guests on all my shows say that the Disney really did the change, started the change on 42nd Street? Do you think so? I think Disney was very important. Uh, it, it because it was, if anything, for 42nd Street was the good housekeeping seal of approval. It certainly was Disney's willingness to make a commitment on that block. But it actually wasn't the first to open. It was an important commitment, but the first real new building or new use to open on that block was the, was the new Victory Theater. And that took one of these old theaters on 42nd Street that for decades had been showing porno movies redeveloped and the new 42nd Street under the really f distinguished leadership of Marion High School and Corcon had this idea of making it into a children's theater. And everyone said, a children's theater on 42nd Street? That's ridiculous. But New York, in fact, very few places, New York, probably no place, had a really good children's theater. And they did it. It's been successful, and it's really right. been remarkable. And, and after that, you know, now the four towers were built. Right. You know, Douglas Durst being first, and then the other towers by everyone else. So now it's 1994, 
and Weisbrod, the, uh, the public servant, goes to a place that you may have seen in the other things. You go down to lower Manhattan to get involved with the largest business improvement district. What do you do now? In the early 90s, the, the uh, Another series of uh, economic climate <laughs> it was a, hardship. It was a very tough time for New York. And uh, when I was, I had been running from 1990 to 1994, the city's economic development corporation it established really the city's Economic Development Corporation, and one of the issues we were working on was Lower Manhattan, and uh, this is the oldest. This was the the center, the capital of capitalism, really, for the first half of the 20th but century. It was falling. I mean, but it was when you went there in 1994. There were real estate developers who bought buildings, and people can't believe this, for five dollars a square foot. That's exactly right, because. I, I, the area, the, the question on everyone's mind was which, which corporation was going to be the last one to turn out the light in the, in the financial district. I think everyone was concerned we were going to lose the financial district totally. Um, and a lot of the reason was because uh, uh, buildings had been foreclosed. Uh, they had been foreclosed by non-commercial banks in many cases. Those banks were unwilling to sell them because They'd have to write them down dramatically, mark them down to market Doesn't on their sound books. A little different, fourteen years later. It, yeah. it, 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 history is history a way of repeating itself. itself. Um, and so there were a lot of shuttered buildings. There was a, no economic activity. The business community in Lower Manhattan had always been a little concerned about whether it should be a business district. And uh, well, I was we had asked, the trade center. and we had the trade center, which also had a huge vacancy rate. It had just right. uh, recovered the, from right. the nineteen ninety three bombing. The retail wasn't that good. You the know, retail, the was, retail terrible. was terrible. Alexander's was there. You know, it was a it different was market. terrible. And and remember, it had suffered the nineteen ninety three bombing. And and so um, the business owners, property owners in Lower Manhattan, asked me to set up a business improvement district. And I think it became clear to all of us at the same time that. We really had to make this into a different kind of neighborhood. We worked with the Giuliani administration to create incentives for property owners to convert their buildings from commercial use, from old buildings who, which no longer really served a commercial purpose, to residential use. Which and was that great. Was with extraordinarily the, I mean, successful. The, the, the program, the 421G program, people don't realize how great it was because it gave the full tax abatement and allowed these owners who bought these buildings to really make it profitable for themselves and starting to make downtown a true 24-7. Absolutely. It started really in 1995 with the passage of the 421G program. It was proposed by the mayor. It was actively supported then by Speaker Silver um, and Governor Pataki. The program was implemented. A lot of people said, all right, you've got these incentives, but no one's really going to provide the financing. And then Union Labor Life came forward. Uh, the Whitehall Fund, Goldman Sachs Whitehall Fund, came forward and said, we'll provide the financing. And everyone said, yeah, maybe we'll get financing, but no one's actually going to live down here. And people started moving in, and people said, oh, they'll live down here, but only for a year or two. And over the past 14 years, it's really developed into a thriving mixed-use community. And, and it's really one of the things that uh, uh, saved Lower Manhattan after uh, September 11th, because it's the, the residents that have have really been the, the along with the business owners, but the residents who've really shown their staying power in Lower Manhattan. And we now, I don't think any of us would have thought in our lifetime that Tiffany's um, or AMS would be opening up stores in, in Lower Manhattan. It would have been inconceivable. Right. And then I even think, you know, when Ed uh, Minskoff, you know, he was originally going to build offices, and then he built a residential. Uh, no one would see a Whole Foods, uh, a large Barnes & Noble, a Bed Bath & Beyond. You know, th this is going on there. So, so it's interesting because now you're gravitating further to where I'm talking with Eddie Minskoff. So it's 2005. Right. And I have to say, one of the not well... Uh, uh, remembered, but one of the things that that actually was extremely important in bringing downtown back in the mid '90s was uh, we tend to bash them, but in truth, the Port Authority did a great job in the World Trade Center. They repositioned the retail, they they attracted 
commercial tenants to replace office uh, state and, and, and state offices. Um, they really did a great job. And, and uh, I think you also have to say what was happening in Battery Park City at that time also. Totally. I mean, that, even though people say it's different, it really made the difference. No I mean, question. Was, and that was part of your area also. So it's, how, how, now, the pity is you still went to work for non, another nonprofit. You always went to nonprofit. I've always worked for not for profits. Okay, <laughs> it's 2005. This small little company, you know, the Trinity Church, at that time 311 years old, I think it was. Okay, they, they find this guy who grew up in the Bronx, who was born in the Bronx, you know, Weisbrod, to run Trinity Real Estate. Six million square feet, one of the largest property owners. Six million square feet of commercial space, and we have some development rights too. And um, you're right, we're one of the, if not the oldest uh, property owner in the large property owner in the city. We've uh, uh, been around for 300 years. And what, what it attracted me to Trinity was, first, its, um, it, it, its values are really my values. I think they stand for, uh, the church stands for values I care about. And second, um, I, love, I love dealing in Revitalizing neighborhoods. I and Times look, Square and, 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 and look, look, look and at Hudson Square. I mean, over the last couple of years, the revitalization of Hudson Square with all the entertainment companies, the media companies, the nonprofits. I mean, a lot of space has been leased over the last couple. We've of years. done a very. We've we've really taken advantage of this market and Hudson Square, which is the area really between Canal Street and Houston Street, Sixth Avenue to almost the Hudson River. And then we go a little south of Canal, a little north of Houston, a little east of Sixth Avenue. But um, uh, we're like a, a little hole in the donut that's surrounded by Greenwich Village to the north, Soho to the east, Tribeca to the south. And it's um, we once did a, 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 a Google uh, search, and we found millions of hits on Greenwich Village, Soho, Tribeca, and about 50,000 hits on Hudson Square. And it was sort of like a neighborhood that people had forgotten. They call, I put it on 1010 wins. You know, I've spoken You've done about, it. I've, right. Okay. You know, but even politically, you know, y y your wife, she's been, uh, she's been a judge for uh, many years? She's been a judge for 14, 15 years now, I think maybe 16 years. Originally and appointed by Mayor Dinkins, reappointed by Mayor Bloomberg. And a family court judge, and a son who's uh, a student at Columbia Journalism School and passionate about journalism, which I'm very proud of. And look at what you've done. I mean, truly, you have changed. I mean, this picture is very perfect for you. I mean, if I have to, I mean, Lower Manhattan, yeah. the Business Improvement District, Times Square, Queens, Bronx, and everything, um, it's truly been an interesting uh, life. I feel so fortunate because I've really done work that I've enjoyed for the last 35 years. And I, 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 there haven't been many days when I've been bored or unhappy, very few. So and it's really appropriate that uh, a true builder of New York has been my guest today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Greenberg Traurig, New York Community Bank, Bank of America. Additional funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, XL Realty Advisors, LP, Essex Capital Partners, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, GVA Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, 
Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Katsimatidis, Kilroy Metal Products, Marcus and Millichap, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M and T Bank, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sheldrake Organization, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynan Organization.